Hi, Tom. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I am doing fine. And you? I couldn't be better. Uh, <laughs> I mean, no, I kid. But it's I'm very happy to be talking to you. Let me introduce us. I'm uh, Robert Wright, publisher of the Non-Zero Newsletter. This is a Non-Zero podcast. You're Thomas Graham, distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. You also have a position at Yale University. And most important for uh, today's purposes, uh, you're author of a book called Getting Russia R Right, which we're going to talk about. Um, you've been thinking about Russia for a long time, uh, a lot of it during your career in public service. Right. Uh, you're on, you on the National Security uh, Council during the George W. Bush administration. Uh, before that, uh, you had a couple of stints in Moscow as a foreign service officer in uh, both the late so Soviet and early post-Soviet periods, I guess. So you were, you were there That's in correct. the 90s. Um, and also in the 90s, you served in the State Department. Uh, uh, and uh, so on the policy planning staff, and I think you had another position there. So this is kind of uh, your life's work, uh, in a sense, what we're about to talk about, right? Man, right. I've been doing it for 40 years professionally. OK, well, that's it. That's long enough. And 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 I have to say, I'm heartened uh, to hear that somebody who knows as much as you do feels that it's possible that we can uh, forge a relationship of constructive engagement with Russia, because that's not how I would describe our relationship right now. Absolutely. Um, and why don't why don't we start there? Uh, it's an interesting time to be talking because. Uh, it seems like only in the last few weeks we've seen clear signs that it's dawning on important people in Ukraine, if it hasn't already, that maybe stalemate is about the best they can hope for. Right. Uh, there was this kind of inter this story in Time magazine that uh, it was about Zelensky, and the story was kind of like he's the only one who may not yet realize that was was kind of the upshot of the story. Right. Uh, the only one in Ukraine, even. Uh, and uh, and and now there are reports that the Biden administration may be starting to use its leverage to push Ukraine toward a uh, negotiating table. Um, so I wanted to start by getting your take on just the the state of play. Like where where are we? Are are is is it possible that this thing is going to wind down? If so, what might that look like? And so on. Well, it's a really complicated situation. I think we are in a period. Uh, of stalemate at this point. Uh, the Russians uh, launched an offensive earlier this year. That went nowhere. Uh, there was a much anticipated Ukrainian counteroffensive over the summer, uh, and that has gone uh, nowhere. The battle lines are basically where they were uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, so we are approaching a situation uh, in which it's becoming increasingly clear that neither side really has the wherewithal uh, to turn this, to, to make a dramatic breakthrough on the battlefield uh, that turns around this conflict uh, that leads to what uh, what one or the other side might uh, might call victory. And in a situation like that, uh, minds begin to turn towards uh, winding the conflict down, moving towards the negotiating uh, table and seeing uh, what's the best thing that you can uh, get at the, uh, through diplomacy. You know, with that said, uh, I still don't think that uh, either Moscow or Kiev uh, is intent on moving towards negotiation anytime soon. Mm. Uh, I think it's clear that there are uh, divisions within the Ukrainian leadership as to how to uh, pursue this conflict. Uh, but if you look at uh, public opinion of polls in Ukraine, uh, still a large majority of the Ukrainians uh, believe that they should continue this conflict. Uh, they still believe that it is possible to evict Russia from the uh, all the territory that is seized over the past a decade. Um, and that puts, I think, the leadership in a difficult position. Land for peace is not something that's going to go over well uh, with the Ukrainian population. Look at this from the Russian standpoint. Uh, President Putin clearly thinks that Russia is more resilient, uh, that it has greater resources uh, than Ukraine. Population is three times the size of Ukraine, for example. Uh, he's put the economy on a war footing. He looks at what's happening uh, in the West, particularly the United States, and believes that Western support for Ukraine is going to crack. And therefore, uh, there's no reason for him to stop at this point and negotiate. Uh, let's see what 2024 brings. 
um, at the end of 2024, if there's no substantial change, maybe that's the time to sit down and negotiate. So I think we're looking at at least another uh, another year of conflict. So you think Putin is hoping to gain more ground, significant amounts of more additional ground in Ukraine? Uh, I, I think at a minimum, he hopes to gain um, all the territory of the, the regions that he's uh, formerly annexed into, uh, into Russia. He did that last year. Uh, he doesn't control these four provinces totally in, in any event. I think that is uh, what he hopes to achieve, and he hopes he can do that through military means. So, so he hopes to gain control of all of those four provinces because he because they don't entirely, as you said, control any of them, and and some of them they don't control. You know, I think even half of. So, that's right. so I mean, that's a lot of, and 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 I gotta think he himself is understanding that it's a difficult. Uh, you know, a lot of people have started to say that maybe the current the current technology of war almost favors stalemate, you know, and 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 then there's the fact that about, you know, a good portion of each year is not hospitable to offense by virtue of the weather and so on. Um, you th but you think he actually uh, hopes to get all four all of all four uh, provinces? That's kind of disturbing. Well, you know, it's hard to know exactly what uh, what Putin is aiming mm -hmm. for at this point. Um, you know, at the beginning, we thought he wanted all of Ukraine. Uh, yeah. Certainly, he wanted the capital. He wanted to change the the regime. Uh, you know, that proved beyond uh, Russia's capabilities last year, and I think it continues to be on uh, Russia's capabilities. I think the question for the Kremlin, and particularly for Putin, is uh, what could he sell to the Russian? Not so much the Russian population, but the Russian elite uh, as a victory mm -hmm. uh, in, in this conflict. Uh, you know, they have formally annexed these uh, these four territories. Um, it's hard to see how you can claim victory if you don't control all of those uh, those provinces. So I think that would be a minimal goal at this point. I think they did about a year ago signal flexibility on the southern two provinces, not on the two that constitute the Donbass. But there was some language where, OK, ultimately the territory will be determined by the will of the people or something or other. They seemed, and of course, for probably historical reasons, they'd be less attached uh, to full conquest there than in the Donbass. Does that yeah, make that, sense? Yeah, that might uh, uh, might be so. I mean, the, the presidential spokesman said, well, we haven't really decided on the borders of these regions. Right. Um, you know, they ran the referenda in, in all four overwhelming victory, but, you know, a substantial part of the population didn't participate. Um, so I think that's a, a question mark at this point. But um, again, it's difficult to know exactly what's in Putin's mm -hmm. mind at this point. Uh, but that would seem uh, to me to be a sort of a reasonable stopping point where you could step back, say we won. Um, uh, now let's move on. Yeah. So, I mean, if indeed time favors Russia, which it has seemed to me was the case uh, for some time, and he has aspirations beyond the land he certainly holds. It's starting to look like, as a practical matter, uh, victory for Ukraine would consist of freezing things right here and talking peace in a certain sense. Well, you know, this is a problem that we've had from the, the very beginning in defining what victory means uh, for, for any of the sides in this conflict. Uh, you know, President Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, uh, has defined peace or victory as regaining all the territory uh, that is internationally recognized as Ukraine. And this goes back to the breakup of the Soviet Union, the 1991 borders. That certainly uh, appears to be beyond uh, Ukraine's capabilities uh, at, at this point. Um, so uh, he would have to compromise on that. You know, I think the way to define victory for Ukraine, uh, and this is something that the Ukrainians should uh, embrace, I think the United States should embrace as well, uh, is the emergence of a strong, prosperous, uh, democratic Ukraine anchored uh, in the West. Um, that requires um, sort of stopping the Russian aggression where it is at this point, uh, but it's also a longer term process, a political and economic reform inside Ukraine uh, that makes the, the country uh, part of a larger uh, Euro-Atlantic Euro community. Um, and so, we tend to think only about the, the military aspects uh, of this conflict uh, to achieve the type of goal that is good for Ukraine, that would be good for, for Europe and the United States. It's a much longer term project. Uh, 
uh, and something that we should be focusing on right now. So territory becomes a secondary issue, not uh, totally insignificant, but secondary uh, to defining victory for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, and on the on the Ukrainian kind of political side and, and social side, as you said, uh, you know, public opinion polls suggest that the Ukrainian people aren't aren't ready to to settle for the for the current uh, lines. Um, on the other hand, the government hasn't worked very hard to move public opinion in that direction. I mean, both in the sense that they have professed kind of maximalist aims. They haven't been uh, forthcoming about casualties, although I'm sure the, the people in Ukraine have a sense for the level of um, carnage. The other thing is that the government has a lot of control over the media there, and they right. haven't used that as they might to shape public opinion. Uh, so I assume that if, I mean, I don't want to be too harsh, but if reality kind of dawns on them, uh, they would start working, moving in that, you know, they'd start working those levers, uh, but that would presumably take time. You know, I think that's right. And that will be the first indication that they are, uh, that they've recognized uh, finally, that this is a stalemate, that they can achieve the, uh, the maximal goals that they had set out at the beginning of the conflict. And it's time to move towards a negotiating table uh, and see what the best deal is that you can get un mm -hmm. under the circumstances. Uh, so you would expect some of that to begin to come out uh, in public. Uh, in fact, um, you know, the uh, the interview that the um, uh, the top military commanders, Luzhny, gave uh, to The Economist talking about a stalemate, uh, I think is the first step in that direction. The Time article, um, you know, however that source is a first step in that uh, direction, beginning uh, to prepare the Ukrainian population uh, for the idea that they're going to have to settle for something less than the maximal goals that were set at the beginning of this at the beginning of this conflict. Mm -hmm. um, so the 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 question you address in your book: How do we move this uh, toward a more put it on a more constructive plane, our relationship with Russia is, is you know, intertwined with how we got to where we are mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and what, uh, you know, how American policy has played out up to this point. Um, and uh, which in turn is related to the question of like uh, why Putin invaded to begin with. And there's a range of views on this, you know, the kind of strict Mearsheimer view that it's, mainly about NATO uh, and, and to the extent that it's not NATO expansion, it's kind of the de facto NATOization of Ukraine that was driving him crazy and, and seemed to him a, a genuine security threat. Uh, and then there are, you know, there's a whole spectrum, of course, uh, all the way up to he, he just uh, is, uh, a you know, is delusionally imperialist. Um, what, what is your what is your guess on on like why he invaded? Look, I mean, this is a, a very complicated uh, question. I mean, the first thing uh, you need to understand is the place that Ukraine itself occupies in, uh, in the Russian imagination. Um, you know, this is not only Putin, uh, it's an entire elite that has been concerned about, uh, about Ukraine. Uh, you know, the territory that is now occupied uh, by Ukraine, uh, was the origins of Russian statehood, Kiev and Rus, um, way back in the you know the ninth and, and tenth centuries. The origins of were the source of Russia's uh, religious belief, Orthodoxy. Uh, you know, during the the imperial period, the territory that is now occupied by Ukraine or now is Ukraine was an important buffer zone uh, for uh, the the Russian state, Muscovy, uh, initially against powers to the west, which included Poland. You know, eventually Austria and Germany and nomadic tribes, the Ottoman Empire to the south. So it was an important buffer zone. Uh, and then in the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, the area where we see the most intense fighting, the Donbass, was actually industrial heartland uh, of the Russian Empire. It produced most of its coal, most of its steel. Uh, it was also the breadbasket of the Russian Empire. Uh, and Russia uh, at that time would not have been a great power. Uh, without control uh, of this territory. Um, Ukraine was also an integral part of the Soviet military industrial complex, producing many of its ballistic missiles, for example. So this was an important uh, part of the Russian empire, an important part of Russian power. 
Uh, and the, the Russian political elite has never really been fully reconciled uh, with the independence of Ukraine after the breakup of the Soviet Union, um, and never been fully rec reconciled with the fact that Crimea, uh, the mm -hmm. peninsula in the Black Sea, uh, was you uh, was Ukrainian territory, not Russian territory. And, and, uh, and it was, within the Soviet Union, Crimea was part of Russia until the 1950s. It was part of the Russian, it was one republic until right. the 1950s, right? That, that's correct. And then it was transferred to Ukraine by Nikita Khrushchev on the 300th anniversary of the uh, Union of, uh, of mm. Russian, uh, Russia and Ukraine. Um, and uh, it's populated by a significant number of um, uh, retired Soviet military officers and now Russian um, uh, military officers. The overwhelming majority of the population is ethnic Russian. Um, so, um, you know, and, and beyond that, um, uh, some of the great battles in Russian history uh, were fought in Crimea. It's an important uh, narrative in, in in Russian literature. So again, all of this makes Ukraine uh, important to, to the Russians, and they were concerned about uh, Ukraine drifting westward out of the Russian orbit, uh, the NATOization uh, of Ukraine. Uh, you know, all that said, uh, I do believe uh, that before the conflict began, that there was a way of negotiating a solution uh, to Russia's concerns. Uh, we had started down that track. We had perhaps not been as forthcoming as we should have been. Um, but I think there was a, a path uh, forward. And many of the Russian political elites uh, would have uh, preferred to continue those negotiations. Uh, what, was so, the, what was the last chance? What time frame are we talking about here? I think we're talking about uh, December, January, uh, 2020, uh, 2021, 2022. Uh, we had started the negotiations. We gave, the Russians had made certain demands. Uh, we had replied with a, some proposals on arms control. Uh, the key issue uh, for the Russians and the one that we weren't prepared to address at that point was the the geopolitical orientation uh, of, of Ukraine. Um, more With respect to NATO? Right, NATO membership. Right. Uh, I've always thought that we should have been uh, willing to put that issue on the table. Uh, we wouldn't have agreed with the Russians. It would have taken uh, tough negotiations, uh, but simply our unwillingness uh, to even sit down uh, and discuss that with the Russians uh, I think drove Putin in the direction of um, a military operation. Uh, you know, I think there are other factors here as well that, that do have to do with uh, Putin's own uh, personality, the way he looks at the world. Uh, there has been a shift, uh, to my mind, uh, in Putin's approach to uh, foreign policy over the past 20, uh, 20, 20 years or so. And if I could put it very simply, when he came into power, uh, he operated well within, I think, the Russian uh, tradition of, of foreign policy. Very pragmatic, realpolitik is what we would call it. Uh, calculated balances, uh, didn't take uh, inordinate risk in order to advance uh, Russia's interests. Sometime in the past five to six years, he's moved away from this pragmatic approach to something that I would call sort of a messianic approach. Mm -hmm. um, a um, delusions about his own role. Um, uh, uh, in history, uh, as a as a great Russian czar, the gathering of the Russian lands, uh, Russia as this uh, global leader in a, a uh, an anti Western uh, movement, uh, um, and that also I think uh, drove him uh, to uh, to decide that the uh, the solution to the problems of Ukraine uh, was military operation. Now we need to remember uh, that. Uh, Putin had an, an exaggerated sense of the, the capabilities of the Russian military, mm -hmm. uh, uh, underestimated Ukrainian resistance, and Western unity. Not very much different from uh, the way the West thought about this as well. He thought this was going to be a blitzkrieg. Uh, and obviously, if he had uh, rolled into, into Kiev within a week, changed the regime, um, we would be in a much different uh, place than we are now turned out to be a gross miscalculation, and what was supposed to be a blitzkrieg has turned into a stalemate or a war of attrition. Yeah. Now, if you're hopeful that we're, as you're, you know, as you argue in your book, uh, that, the, it, that we could uh, build over time a more constructive relationship with Russia, uh, and you imagine him being the leader for some time, 
uh, you must think you, you use the word delusional, but you must think he's not like dysfunctionally <laughs> delusional. Right? <laughs> I mean, let, let me let me offer a a, 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 a a possibly compatible interpretation of his psychology, uh, which is. Um, I mean, first of all, I think he's somebody who's very sensitive to status issues. And right. Russia is, too, after the Cold War, right? They were a right. great power. And I think I, I want to revisit the, the the whole period of American policy you witnessed, because my take is we were not especially sensitive to that fact. Um, the uh, And, you know, as people, as you don't recognize people's status, it starts to 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 really kind of eat away <laughs> at them. <clears throat> and And as politicians get older, they start to think of legacy, right. and and uh, now you yourself said you thought we could have done a deal maybe as late as this, you know a month before the invasion, a month or two before the invasion. So at that point, he wasn't Peter the Great, and right. and uh, now I agree that he is where he is, and he looks at this map and says, "Well, hey, Crimea, uh, much of the Donbass, this corridor in the south." That happened on my watch. This is going to be my legacy. I, right. I redrew the map. I, I, I returned, uh, you know, uh, what now I'm thinking of as Russia's rightful land, even if that wasn't an obsession of mine 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, and, and, and I might have gone in a different direction then. But, okay, this is where I am. I'm getting old. This is my legacy. Uh, to, that That's a... Uh, I guess a slightly more flattering interpretation than flat out delusional. D does that make sense to you? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a certain element of, of truth there. I mean, I, uh, when I'm talking about delusional, I think it's the uh, the failure to see clearly what the objective realities were, the strength of the Russian right. military, by right. uh, the Ukraine and so forth. Uh, that led him to uh, make a decision to launch uh, a military conflict, uh, which another Russian leader perhaps wouldn't have done. Uh, if he was more cognizant uh, uh, of what the real balance of power was and the challenges that, would, that Russia would face uh, going forward. Let me pick up on a point that you made about Russia as a great power. I mean, I think this is a core element uh, of Russian national identity that goes back decades and probably centuries. Uh, and it's important to remember that uh, in the Russian mind, uh, yes, capabilities are important, uh, but more important than that is being a great power is a mindset. It's the way you think about your role in the world. Uh, you know, Russia has gone through cycles of uh, strength and weakness, rise and decline. Um, and so even when a country like Russia uh, is down on, uh, down on its luck, as it was at the very end of the Cold War into the 1990s, uh, that doesn't mean for Russians they're not a great power. They're simply a great power uh, that's down on its luck. They will come back. Uh, and that needs to be respected. The role that uh, they have played in European history, the role that they can play uh, going forward needs to re be respected. And that certainly wasn't our view uh, in the uh, in the 1990s, 2000, even up to today. I mean, if you ask the question in Washington, is Russia a great power? You'll get a debate uh, about that. Um, and so, uh, you know, our sort of idea of a great power is focused almost exclusively on capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and Russia was uh, in decline in the 1990s, a tremendous socioeconomic crisis after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, and so um, there were sort of uh, diametrically opposed uh, views of, of Russia, the role it was going to play uh, on a global stage. That had an impact on the overall state of the relations uh, and continues um, to have an impact. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm curious as to what, you know, if you could go back and magically change two or three basic elements of American policy toward Russia, uh, in in the, I mean, uh, you know, from from the end of the Cold War uh, up until I don't know the the beginning of the Biden administration, say, or uh, the beginning of the Trump administration, say, through Obama. Um, I'm wondering what they'd be. I, you know, I remember uh, when the when the Cold War ended, I was at the New Republic in Washington. Right. And, you know, Frank Fukuyama's essay had come out. It wasn't yet a book, but the end of history. And the sense was very much, you know, that, uh, well, the natural order of things is uh, for Russia to become just like us. And they seemed to kind of want that. And uh, 
and 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 I think look, I personally think we could be much closer to that now than we are. Uh, but that was the expectation anyway. It didn't work out. What what? Uh, can you go through, you know, just a short list of things that maybe we could have done better or maybe thought about this in a better way? Or, Well, well, first, I think we misread the situation in Russia at that time. I mean, you've already referred to Fukuyama. Globalization was taking off at that time as well, sort of reinforced the view uh, that free market democracy was the only way a country could uh, survive and thrive into the 21st century. So Russia would have to go down that road. Uh, route. We also uh, talked to a very small group of um, uh, Russian leaders who uh, appeared to accept that um, by that view as well uh, and wanted to reform Russia in a radical way um, in, in order to produce that type of that transition to free market democracy. But I think if you would look more broadly um, at what had happened at the end of the Cold War uh, and into the 1990s, uh, you would come to the conclusion that what we witnessed wasn't a democratic revolution at all. Uh, it was a power struggle uh, between uh, the Soviet leader, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, the Russian uh, leader at that time, but he's uh, Yeltsin. Uh, and what happened uh, as a consequence of the breakup of the Soviet Union is that the upper level uh, of the Soviet elite, uh, what we call the nomenclatura at that time, uh, was pushed to the side, and they were replaced by the second and third echelon um, of that nomenclature inside Russia. Uh, and this was an elite that shared uh, sort of the fundamental views uh, about Russia's role in the world, uh, the structure of uh, political power uh, uh, in Russia, and so forth. Uh, authoritarian, I think, in their, uh, in their basic views of how a political system should be structured, a belief that Russia as I've already talked about, should be a, a, a great power. Uh, and our, uh, our policy uh, was focused on what I, uh, an effort to change Russia. Uh, the Russian political elite was focused on regaining Russian power. Uh, and that was a fundamental sort of uh, mm -hmm. mis or disjuncture in the way we thought about things. So we got ourselves involved, uh, I think, uh, to an excessive extent in trying to um, uh, change Russia from the inside, uh, interfering in, in Russian domestic political affairs uh, in a way uh, that turned much of the, the Russian political elite against us uh, over time, particularly as the, um, as the crisis inside Russia deepened during the 1990s. Uh, so, you know, one, uh, I think we uh, should have had a better understanding of what uh, was really going on in Russia. Uh, two, we shouldn't have been so uh, directly involved in trying to uh, produce a um, uh, an American version of Russia uh, inside Russia in the 1990s. Uh, and then I think three, uh, in part because we saw uh, Russia as weak, uh, we tried to uh, uh, put in place um, policies or uh, uh, create facts on the ground that would uh, preclude a, a resurrection uh, of Russian power in the future. Uh, NATO expansion was one of those. Uh, we had the opportunity uh, to pursue a different approach in, in Europe. Uh, we had, in fact, developed what we call the Partnership for Peace Program uh, in the early 1990s, the Clinton administration, uh, that uh, brought all the, the countries of the former Soviet bloc into some sort of relationship uh, with NATO, uh, but without uh, promises of near-term NATO membership from uh, former Soviet bloc countries, um, a, a process that didn't create obvious lines in the ground uh, in, in, in Europe uh, that uh, was acceptable to Russia um, at that time. And if we had uh, continued along that path, we may have been able to develop a more uh, constructive working relationship uh, uh, with Russia, uh, postpone the issue of NATO expansion, um, and uh, in a sense, uh, help Russia uh, adapt, uh, acculturate itself to the new geopolitical realities in a way that would have been uh, sufficient for, for Russian security purposes and uh, over the long haul, uh, better for American interest in Europe. But we didn't do that. So is your, of course, this goes back to the 90s when Putin wasn't the guy, but is your sense that Putin initially 
although he may not have been enthusiastic about uh, remodeling Russia's uh, political system in America's image, uh, he he did want to become, he did want Russia to become, if not part of the West, deeply intertwined with it in a, in a constructive way. Well, I mean, certainly, if you look at the first uh, three or four years of, uh, of Putin's presidency, uh, he wanted to build a partnership with the United States. Um, you know, we talked about a, a counterterrorism alliance at that point after the, the events of, mm -hmm. you know, the terrorist attacks of 9-11 uh, in, in the United States. Um, uh, we set out a, in, a, uh, in a document in uh, 2002, a framework for uh, a U.S.-Russian strategic partnership um, that involves sort of geopolitical elements, arms control elements, uh, economic, social elements as well. Uh, so Putin, again, was intent on restoring Russian power, uh, but certainly in the early years uh, of his presidency, believed that the quickest way to restoring Russian power was in fact working with uh, what was the most powerful country in the, in the world at that time, the United States, um, and using that relationship as a way of uh, enhancing Russia's uh, position on the global stage, getting the resources that Russia needed uh, to rebuild its economy um, uh, and to rebuild its its influence on the global stage. Now, what changed here and, and what changed um, uh, Putin's mind is I think that the United States uh, during that time moved very aggressively uh, to erode Russia's influence in the former Soviet Union. Um, uh, we never recognized any of the institutions that came or emerged after the breakup of the Soviet Union that were intended to sort of maintain some unity uh, within the former Soviet Union. The Commonwealth of Independent States, for example, the Collective Security Treaty Organization that was led by Russia. Um, uh, there were uh, uh, agreements that uh, that Russia reached which, uh, with some uh, of the, the former Soviet states to tone down the, the conflicts um, uh, in, in, in those states. We pushed against those because we didn't want uh, Russia uh, to have any significant influence uh, in the future of these countries. And then, of course, um, the two big issues, uh, and I think the ones that turned uh, Putin's thinking about the United States 180 degrees, uh, was the Chechen conflict um, and the Orange Revolution uh, in, in Ukraine in 2004. Mm -hmm. So the Chechen conflict, I mean, he expected... He thought we were shoulder to shoulder in the war on terrorism. We should say, you know, at, right after 9-11, he, he, you know, was, I think, maybe the first foreign leader to call George Bush, uh, offered to help, did help us in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, it seemed to me almost immediately Bush began failing to reciprocate. Uh, I don't think you put a lot of emphasis on the anti-ballistic missile treaty, but he didn't want Bush to get out of that. He He, he wanted to preserve that. And Bush, you know, very soon after 9-11 and Putin's show of support, uh, I think told them, no, we, we are going to get out of the ABM treaty. So that was, a, if nothing else, a disappointment for them, right? Uh, but you don't put a lot of emphasis on that. No, I don't, because, um, you know, we then began to negotiate a, um, a, an arms control agreement. Um, uh, so there was some cooperation in uh, and, uh, in that regard, this has become much more of an issue for the Russians now than it was uh, in 2001, 2002, when these events uh, occurred. I think the what was much more important to uh, uh, to Putin was the Chechen conflict. Uh, we were supposed to be allies uh, in this battle against uh, international terrorism at that point. Uh, you'll remember that. President Bush presented the the world with sort of a binary choice. You're either with us or you're with the terrorists. Right. You, got, you have to choose sides. And when it came to Chechnya, um, uh, which was in rebellion against uh, Moscow and where there were certain elements of the Chechen um, resistance that had ties with uh, recognized terrorist groups, uh, the argument we made, well, well, this is a little bit different. Um, you know, some of these Chechen uh, rebels have uh, legitimate grievances against Moscow, historically based and so forth. Um, and there's a certain element of truth there. Uh, uh, and, you know, it's a difficult um, sort of uh, issue for the U.S. government to uh, to deal with. But the fact of the matter is 
uh, our position was either with the terrorists or, or with us. Uh, and when it came to the Chechens who were fighting Moscow, we were prepared to make an exception. That didn't sit well with President Putin. Right. Now, uh, you know, you could also cast the Chechenian uh, mistake on the part of American policymakers, if, if you consider it a mistake, in, in a different light, which is to say it's another example. You know, we didn't just kind of not help them in Chechnya. We we vocally criticized the approach they were taking to suppress what they viewed as a, as a terrorist threat, and I guess we viewed as uh, an expression of legitimate nationalist aspirations. I, mean, I, I don't know how we viewed it, but the point is, we actually we criticized their approach to it, and leaving aside the whole war on terror rhetoric, uh, we we had um, you know already put forth from Russia's point of view that was an internal affair. OK, that was within the borders of Russia. And in that sense, this is related to uh, 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 the the mistake you identified earlier of wanting to remake Russia in America's image. I mean, I, I guess I want to uh, I'd like to ask you a generic question. Has I, I know Russia is your main concern, but I know you pay attention to other parts of foreign affairs. Do you think America has in general? In the last over the last 20, 30 years, put too much emphasis on the internal affairs of nations, which, in my view, we almost invariably fail to influence in the direction we want to influence them anyway. <laughs> right. And this is often in the form of human rights issues and so on. And the intentions are good. But it seems we put a lot of emphasis on that. Uh, and. There can be a trade-off between how much influence you, you know, your attempt to exert influence there and your attempt to uh, influence the external behavior of nations. For example, whether they'll invade other countries. Uh, do you do you think there's been a, a, a general mistake of emphasis there in American foreign policy? Yeah, I mean, this has certainly been the case since the, the end of the Cold War. Uh, when uh, we thought we were on the cusp of a a sort of a, a general a democratic revolution uh, around the globe and the countries would be moving in this direction. Um, you know, tied to that was uh, the fact that, uh, you know, terrorism did become an issue, particularly after 9-11. Uh, and the argument uh, that you heard in Washington was um, that, uh, you know, what was happening domestically in countries uh, could produce a, uh, a an external threat uh, to U.S. interests uh, around the globe. So therefore, we had to pay more attention to the internal uh, our, uh, the internal structures, the internal politics of, um, uh, of countries. Uh, you know, Russia uh, would be one of those, but, uh, you know, we were more focused on what was happening in the Middle East at that time. I think Iraq, um, an obvious example. And the third element here uh, was uh, that there was, in fact, no great power rival to the United States uh, at this point, which sort of gave us a free hand uh, mm -hmm. to do what we wanted to do. Uh, at least that was the view uh, inside of Washington. So there was no sort of, um, how can you put this, um, a countervailing force uh, that would have disciplined the use of American power uh, that would have uh, caused us to step back uh, and think about the implications of trying to uh, change the domestic political structures of, um, uh, of states, particularly when you're talking about a big state uh, like Russia. You know, one of the reasons we fail uh, in this is uh, is because it's very difficult as outsiders to understand uh, the domestic politics of any uh, of any other country. Uh, right. So we get in in ways uh, we think they operate the way the United States does. Anybody who's lived abroad, who's studied uh, foreign societies would realize that's not true at all. Um, mm -hmm. And so we exaggerated uh, our influence. Uh, we uh, misconstrued uh, the developments inside countries along American lines, uh, and for the most part, uh, you know, ended up in uh, producing situations uh, that were worse for us, uh, were worse for the people of those countries uh, than was the case before uh, before our intervention began. Mm -hmm. And you know, one sign of this blurring of the line between uh, a country's you know internal policies and its external policies is you, you sometimes hear. In a list of kind of uh, you know Putin crimes, uh, 
uh, Russia hawks will say, you know, uh, you know, they'll even use the word invade sometimes with respect to Chechnya. But but they'll 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 list like Chechnya along with the Ukraine invasion as if they're the same thing. Now they do have some things in common: brutal, horrible, uh, worthy of condemnation, maybe, but. Only the invasion of Ukraine is a violation of the UN Charter as traditionally construed. You know, before, uh, you know, before uh, the evolution of this kind of still iffy concept of responsibility to protect, where when people started trying to move that into the realm of international law, um, and uh, so let's uh, let's let's talk about so Ukraine is that's their external uh, that's their external behavior, and you mentioned. Or our early policy, I guess you're referring to the Orange Revolution and what, what was that, 2004? Putin uh, perceived, well, remind us what the Orange Revolution was and why Putin thought uh, the U.S. had played an indefensible role in it and how close he was to being correct. Well, uh, you know, the Orange Revolution uh, emerges out of a, a disputed election in Ukraine, uh, presidential election in, in Ukraine in 2004. Uh, there was a significant element of, uh, of Ukrainian society that believed that the, the results had been falsified, uh, had, uh, had produced a victory for uh, a candidate that was uh, personally favored by Putin. Putin, in fact, had campaigned on his behalf inside uh, Ukraine on a couple of occasions, uh, so a pro-Russian uh, uh, candidate, um, and people went out in the streets and protested, um, and protested sufficiently that the uh, the ultimate conclusion was that the, the elections had to be rerun, uh, and when they were rerun, uh, lo and behold, a pro-Western candidate came out uh, uh, on top. Uh, you know, Putin clearly saw an American hand uh, in this in this operation. I think, uh, you know, I was in the administration at, at that time that, um, you know, this was largely uh, a matter of uh, of indigenous factors uh, driven by, by Ukrainians themselves. Uh, that doesn't mean that we didn't offer support uh, for this, that um, uh, we were more than happy uh, that the election result uh, was overturned. Uh, and once uh, a pro-Western uh, uh, president was installed in Ukraine, uh, we began to take actions uh, that would have further tied uh, Ukraine uh, to the West, despite the fact that there were significant uh, uh, internal divisions in, in, within Ukraine itself as to whether the country should uh, move westward, west, westward, how closely it should be tied to Russia, uh, and so forth. Um, so Putin saw this, or at least interpreted this, uh, as an effort by uh, the United States. Uh, to pull Russia, or excuse me, pull Ukraine out of Russia's orbit, uh, to erode Russia's influence uh, in the former Soviet space. And as we've talked in a country uh, that for, for the Russian political elites uh, was uh, an important element uh, of Russian status and power uh, on the global stage. And uh, so I assume, okay, there were, there were American NGOs I'm sure we're in Ukraine and supportive of the Orange Revolution. That's probably one thing Putin saw as an extension of American power. Was the I assume that's true. Was the National Endowment for Democracy, which which is actually support, is actually an arm of the American government, was it involved as well? Yeah, no, no. You had the um, uh, the what is it the uh, the National Democratic uh, Organization, the International Republican Institute, uh, involved in this, supporting uh, various uh, elements on the Ukrainian side. Um, I think the uh, National Endowment for Democracy was also engaged in some way. I have to go back and check that. But there are other NGOs uh, that were also uh, providing uh, support of one sort or another towards the democratic development of Ukraine. Um, that's mm -hmm. what our reform programs were about uh, at mm -hmm. that point. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> excuse me, and they tended to support those elements uh, inside Ukraine that were pro-democratic pro-reform, pro-Western, uh, and less support uh, uh, towards uh, elements that were uh, in opposition uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to the West. Uh, so you can see how Putin would have interpreted this as a, a clear effort by the United States uh, to turn Ukraine against Russia. 
The other sort of complicating factor here, or what exacerbates the situation uh, for, for the Kremlin, is that these institutions were also operating in Russia, doing the same types of programs. Mm -hmm. um, and so Putin uh, quickly draws a link between the two. Uh, Ukraine becomes the dress rehearsal. The real goal uh, is regime change inside Russia uh, itself. Uh, and that's the way it was interpreted. Uh, and Russia began to take steps uh, uh, domestically to reduce the risk of that type of outcome. So the real sort of crackdown uh, on civil society organizations comes against the backdrop uh, of developments uh, in, in Ukraine. The effort to push out uh, Western funded uh, organizations um, uh, begins in earnest at that point. Uh, the Kremlin begins to develop um, excuse me, youth, uh, youth movements uh, that uh, it can put on the streets to push back against uh, protest movements by, uh, by pro-Western elements inside Russia. Um, and, you know, I had a, a conversation at that time uh, with a, a senior Kremlin official. We made it quite explicit uh, that we're developing these organizations because we are not going to lose uh, on the streets uh, the battle for, for the future of Russia. Uh, uh, to Western Western organized protesters. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we might call that paranoia, uh, but it was a reality uh, for the Russians, uh, and it did lead uh, to a significant change in the way they thought about uh, the relationship with the United States. Uh, and the deterioration in relationship, um, uh, I think, begins at that point uh, in a significant way. There's sort of ups and downs, uh, but it puts us on a uh, on a glide path. Uh, that gets us to uh, where we are today. Mm -hmm. And when you say uh, Ukraine became a dress rehearsal, you mean in Putin's mind, you don't mean that the Bush administration had a conscious policy of regime change in Moscow, I assume. On the other hand, uh, he wasn't wrong to think that the same uh, kind of uh, activism among, you know, arms of the U.S. government like National Endowment for Democracy and NGOs as manifested within his borders, as as was our intention, uh, would amount could amount to a political threat to him. That wasn't crazy, even though even if our motivation was purely to foster uh, democracy, that could amount to a political threat to him. Well, uh, certainly that's the way he looked at it. Um, yeah. Uh, and again, it's um, if you put yourself in the Russian mindset, it's not totally irrational, uh, right? We are. Uh, supporting pro-democracy organizations in, in Russia. Uh, at the same time, we were complaining about an authoritarian turn in Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, the pro-democracy organizations that we're supporting um, are interested in regime change, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, it, it makes it very difficult, or we sound duplicitous when we say, well, we're only you know, s sort of funding organizations that are uh, engaged in and political reform, this is no threat to the regime. Um, at the same time, uh, we are criticizing Russia for backsliding on uh, on democratic reform. And then if you're, if, you're Kremlin, if you're in the Kremlin and you're Putin at this point, you see this as a, uh, as a direct threat uh, mm -hmm. to your own position. If not, uh, you know, not immediately, if you play this out over time, uh, the threat grows. And again, you have an example, uh, Ukraine 2004. Uh, of how you believe the United States uh, can use these instruments to affect re uh, regime change. Right. Um, okay, so uh, we've been talking for close to an hour. In a few minutes, uh, I'm going to bring the public part of this podcast to an end, and we're going to move into uh, into kind of overtime uh, and keep uh, talking. And uh, the way to get access to overtime, if people want to, is become paid subscribers of the Non-Zero Newsletter. Uh, failing that, I'd encourage you to become an unpaid subscriber. Uh, and uh, there are various ways to do that. Google non-zero and Substack or, or or click a link in your um in your podcast app. Uh, now, now, in that part of the conversation, I, I, I want to, you know, uh, go move into the the whole twenty fourteen Maidan revolution because in retrospect, I think uh, Putin's uh, apprehension of what happened in two thousand and four kind of foreshadows his reaction to 2014. But before we before we bring it into the public uh, part of the podcast, I want to give you a chance. I also, in, in, in overtime, I want to more fully explore your vision of the future. 
Uh, but but right now in the public part of the podcast, I want to give you a chance to give us, you know, in, in maybe capsulized form, uh, you know, we, we, we spent so much time on background, historical background, which I think is very useful. Uh, but I want to give you a chance to talk about your vision of the future as you as you lay it out in in the book. So why don't you uh, spend a few minutes doing that? Yeah, so, so very, very briefly, I mean, the fundamental point is that no matter what happens in Ukraine, that Russia is going to remain a major challenge for the United States in the years ahead. Uh, we're not going to see a democratic breakthrough. Um, so we're not going to be two countries uh, that share fundamental values. We're not going to see, uh, as some uh, pundits have predicted, the breakup of the Soviet, uh, breakup of Russia. Um, that's simply, uh, I think, uh, not uh, realistic given the uh, the structure of, uh, of Russia at this point. Uh, the Russia that's going to emerge uh, out of this conflict in Ukraine is going to be some version of its historical self. It's going to be authoritarian uh, in its political structure. It's going to have an expansionary impulse in its foreign policy. It's going to be lagging uh, uh, economically and technologically behind the United States. Uh, and yet it's going to be determined to remain a great power on the global stage. It has assets uh, in order uh, to back that up. The largest nuclear arsenal in the world, the richest endowment of natural resources in the world, uh, a permanent needle-wielding seat on the UN Security Council, and it's located in the heart of Eurasia, uh, which allows it to project power uh, in, into most of the critical strategic zones in the world today. Final point uh, is that this Russia uh, will be a competitor of the United States, much as it has been since the United States emerged as a global power at the very end of the 19th century. Uh, that being the case, uh, the challenge for the United States is one, to uh, learn the lessons of the past 30 years, what we got wrong, and apply that to trying to build a, a more constructive relationship with Russia. The immediate task, uh, I think, is, is to uh, change what is an adversarial relationship uh, that we have today, uh, this total lack of um, uh, diplomatic context into what I would call a, uh, a constructive competition between our two countries. So, uh, you know, a reset, um, a strategic partnership uh, between our two countries is not in the cards, but we can compete in a way uh, that is much less dangerous uh, to, uh, to the security of both countries uh, in a way that, in fact, uh, would help advance uh, certainly American interests uh, in, in on various issues, uh, both transnational issues, geopolitical issues uh, across the globe. And that's what we ought to be focused on uh, right now. We need to begin to think long term about the type of relationship we need to have with Russia uh, so that we can protect and advance our interests well into the future. Okay. Uh, and you elaborate on that in the book, Getting Russia Right. And so people should uh, check that out. Um, it's available now. Um, and I want to, uh, thank everybody who stayed with us, uh, this long and again, encourage you to join us in the rest of the conversation. Uh, but in any event, thank you. Um, and in the rest of the conversation, we will resume the narrative, uh, you know, get from 2004 to the Maidan revolution up to the invasion and then spend more time on this, uh, this vision of the future you've just sketched out, uh, just to deepen the incentive for people to join us, uh, in the uh, in the overtime segment, I want to I want to I want to tell them what the first question I'm going to ask you bef before we resume that historical narrative is: uh, How did a seemingly reasonable guy like you wind up in the George W. Bush administration? Uh, <laughs> at the, I don't mean to offend anyone with that question, but that's going to be the question. Okay, uh, so now we're moving into overtime. <laughs> 